Good afternoon. My name is Carolyn. I'm with the Academy of Science. We're very pleased to be partners with the St. Louis Zoo to bring you Conservation Conversations, generously underwritten by Cooper Bussman. Many of you are Academy members and friends. For those of you who are not familiar with the Academy, I'd like to just take a moment to tell you a bit about who we are. The Academy is an independent science organization supported entirely through community contributions. We have been connecting science in the community since 1856 and have a long-standing mission to advance the public understanding of science and inspire the next generation of scientists and science advocates. You can find more information on the Academy and our community-wide events by visiting the website academyofsciencestl.org. If you'd like to receive e-notification of upcoming Academy and St. Louis Zoo public lectures and events, there's an e-news sign-up uh, sheet on the table in the back of the theater and some that will also make their way around the audience this afternoon. If you are a student who needs to verify your attendance, please come, sim come see me after the talk. Um, I also have some coupons for the St. Louis Science Center's um, new exhibits in Omnimax, so if you'd like some of those coupons, you can come see me as well. I do want to mention an upcoming event. Um, the Academy and Zoo also partner to bring you the long-running and popular science seminar series on current and trending topics in science. Our next one is Wednesday, November 7th here at the Zoo in the Living World Auditorium at 7.30. Um, and it'll feature fellows with the African Women in Agricultural Research and Development who will be here to talk about their work to alleviate poverty and increase food security. The talk is free and open to the public. You do not need to register to attend. We also have a few more upcoming um, conservation conversations which you can find out on our website or on the zoo's website. With that said, I'd like to introduce Rachel with the zoo to talk about um, our speakers today. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rachel Macy. I'm the zoological manager of carnivores. I'm very pleased to introduce our partners in Kenya. Uh, Mary and Cosmos have been working together since 2002. Uh, St. Louis Zoo has had a relationship with them since 2003. And in 2008, Wild Care Institute offered their support uh, for Action for Cheetahs in Kenya. Uh, we're very proud to support them in their work. Um, they're doing great work. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Mary Weikstra and Cosmos Wambua to speak to us about Action for Cheetahs in Kenya. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just done. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, so thanks everyone for coming out today. And what we're going to be talking about today is our partnerships in cheetah conservation, um, giving you a little bit of our strategies and our overview for our programs in Kenya. Where is the forward on this one? Okay, so our mission is to promote conservation of cheetahs through research, awareness, and community participation. And that means that our whole program has to encompass a lot of objectives together through many different techniques in working with community, in doing research. All of this is with an objective to identify factors that affect the cheetahs um, through livestock predation and mitigation of conflict. I'm not actually going to be talking a whole lot about that in this presentation. Um, however, what we are going to be spending a lot of time talking about is understanding cheetah habitat selection um, and how that is used to put policies into place. So my, my agenda for this presentation, our agenda for this presentation is to talk about who we are, why we study the cheetah, what's so special about it, a little status and history of the cheetah, our pilot project in Salama and some research results, and then the threats and the actions that we're, that we're doing for cheetah conservation. So a little bit more about myself and, and about Cosmos before we get going because we always have those questions at the end. I've been working in Kenya actually since December of 2010. I grew up in Michigan. I attended Binder Park, or I worked at Binder Park Zoo and Utah's Hogel Zoo. So my background was as a zookeeper moving into zoo exhibit design. Um, I went to Michigan State University and then completed, um, a year ago, I completed my master's degree at Yale University. I've been involved with the Cheetah Conservation Fund starting out through fundraising since 1995. I went out there for the first time in the year 2000 and I worked for six months and at that time I decided that I wanted to start the project in Kenya 
and I did that under the umbrella of the Cheetah Conservation Fund until 2009 when I formed our own organization called Action for Cheetahs in Kenya. Um, so so my, my progression has gone from, from every level of working at the zoo. I actually worked at, at some point in my zoo career even in gift shops and flipping hamburgers, waiting for openings to come in. So, so it was a big progression of working into where I wanted to be. My, my program there is to be program development and to coordinate the research in Kenya. Cosmos has been working with us since February of 2002 and is our, was our senior research assistant and now is our, is our, um, our database manager and, and senior scientist. Um, he has a master's degree also from um, Addis Ababa in, or sorry, from uh, India, and then a master's degree from Addis Ababa. Um, he had a lot of field experience in working with the Ken Kenya Wildlife Service when he began working with us, and then we continued that training into um, S3 GIS mapping and into his master's degree um, out of Ethiopia. And he's the field supervisor, the database manager, um, and does a lot of the analysis of our, of our data. So now let me move into the cheetah itself and what makes the cheetah so unique and so special. Um, the cheetah has a very unique social structure of, of all of the cats in that the female is typically solitary, whereas the males will form a group called a coalition. The female is pregnant for between 95 and 97 days, producing average between four and seven cubs. Out of those four to seven cubs, Less than 50%, sometimes as low as 3% of the cubs survive, and that's due to a variety of reasons from mothers abandoning the cubs to other predators killing the cubs and also to human causes. Those cubs that do survive will stay with the mother between 18 and 20 months, um, at which time the mother teaches the cubs everything they know about how to survive and how to be a cheetah. Then those cubs will spend about another two or four months alone with each other after the mother leaves, a mother spends most of her time raising cubs, and very occasionally will, will adult mothers travel together um, with their cubs maybe of different ages, um, but most of the time they're completely independent. So the males will then form these coalitions and they stay together for life. The females just become mothers over and over and over and spend their life solitary. The cheetahs are very adapted for speed. That's what they're known for as being the fastest land mammal. Their body is streamlined, their claws are semi-retractable, they have very rough foot pads for gripping the ground, and their tail acts like a rudder as they run. They have a stride of eight meters, which is approximately 24 feet. The full length of this, of this stage would be from when a cheetah touches the ground the first time with one foot to touching that, that ground again with the same foot. During two points of that stride, the cheetah is literally flying with their limbs either fully extended or fully moved underneath their body. I know that you guys do a cheetah run, and I saw your, your exhibit and the, and the corners that they would have to take and the kind of ups and downs. They're probably not going to reach 110 kilometers per hour in, a, in an exhibit like that, but out on an open, flat area is when they can reach about, it's, it's the equivalent to about 70 miles per hour. And they can accelerate from zero to that speed in less than three seconds. And the only thing that a human has built that can do the same thing is a Ferrari car that can accelerate at the same rate. Um, everything about them, their loose limb attachment, the way that their muscle structure is, gears towards that ability of that, that long stride. And during the rest of the stride, when they're not flying, only one foot will be touching the ground at a time. So if your cheetahs are kind of loping around um, and they've got more than one feet, they're not reaching their full potential of full speed. But it would be very hard in that exhibit to get a long and straight enough place for them to do that. Um, the other ways that they're equipped for speed is they're daytime hunters. They see the best during the day. They have a similar number of rods and cones in their eyes to humans. Therefore, we believe they see in more color than the average predator. Most predators, we believe, are very much colorblind, whereas, whereas the cheetahs, we believe, can see in full color. They have enlarged nostrils, large lungs, and large hearts that get that oxygen into their body in order to give them that adaptation to speed. They can reach up to 150 breaths per minute when they're at full speed, and that speed can only be maintained for about 400 to 800 meters, about a quarter to a half a mile. Before they're exhausted, then they have to rest. So if they've made a full chase in order to catch their prey, they quite often have to lay down and rest before they can even begin to ingest their food. Um, we do believe that, that that action of running is a part of what helps them to metabolize their food better, 
Um, in zoos and in captivity, sometimes cheetahs um, get ulcers in their stomach, and we believe that that is because that running and that adrenaline rush that they get when they run actually helps them to digest their food. So very active animals tend to have less stomach problems. The next thing we're going to kind of be looking at is, is the threats to the survival of the cheetah. I talked a little bit about what those natural threats are, but what Cosmos and I are out there doing is trying to deal with looking at the issues of human and cheetah interactions and, and what are those threats that can be mitigated by us as other humans. So first we needed to know where the cheetah distribution is. We had data from back in the 1900s until the early 2000s that showed that the cheetah range is declining and cheetah numbers are declining throughout their, their entire home range. I chose Kenya because it is the central to the Eastern Africa population, as well as it is a large population of cheetahs. Um, Tanzania, South Africa, and Botswana have similar around 1,000 cheetahs. We know that we have around 1,500 cheetahs in Kenya. <clears throat> Our study sites are, are, are designed and located based on three years of a national survey. Um, and, and this is what the distribution of cheetahs is as far as where their range is. The range that we identified between 2004 and 2007 um, showed that the cheetahs still lived in over 75% of the, of the historic range. We've set up these particular sites along the fringe habitats of the cheetahs. And, and that basically means that the Salama and the Athi Kapiti Partner Project are in the southern section. Um, it, it was the first one that popped up down on the bottom. And then the one that's on the top is our Maybai or our Samburu study site. And then our partners working in the Masai Mara and Meru. And, and you notice all of these projects are outside of protected parks and reserves. And we'll tell you a little bit more about why um, when we get a little bit further. A part of our study also gave us population estimates, and those estimates are based on the interviews and the sightings during the time that we, that we got all the data to put together that map. And so our range is between 920 and 1740. And the reason that's such a large range is because most of that data was based on the interviews that we conducted. And therefore, if one person in one town says, I saw a mother with three cubs about half the size of the mother, and we move on about 20 kilometers up the road, and you see another mother with cubs that are about half the size of the mother, you can assume it may be the same cheetah if it was a several months apart, or it could be different cheetahs. And therefore, interview data, the way that you have to process that data, gives you this very large range of, of potential population. Um, the roads have a huge impact on cheetahs. Um, all of these red roads that you see Outside of the conglomeration of roads in the middle, we traveled every single one of those roads looking for cheetah population. It took us three years to do this study. And what we found is that because the cheetahs actually do use the roads, the roads are not as negative of an impact on cheetahs as sometimes some of the other predators will avoid the roads. But the cheetahs is actually we use the roads in order to do our research, to find the tracks and the signs that the cheetahs are there. Cosmos will tell you a little bit more about that when he gets to talking about our fecal studies, too. Um, the other thing is we put a, put a buffer around the individual cheetah sightings and signs of cheetahs to show that the cheetahs are actually living in proximity to people. The human settlements that the cheetahs live in are a very important part of our study because what we have to do is look at the coexistence between cheetahs and people. I'm going to pass it over to Cosmos because now he's going to talk about the fun stuff, the, the fun part of our research itself. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mary. Um, well, uh, yeah, the cheetahs are the fastest land mammal, um, but they're also running out of space, and they're running out of food, um, and they're running into humans and getting into conflicts. Um, but on the research, apart from the research, we still have to do other things that are not necessarily science-based. Um, but on the research part, we've been looking at uh, population, um, both of cheetahs and of what they feed on. Um, we've been looking at the conflicts um, between cheetahs and uh, human beings. Um, and we've been trying to work with the community. Um, or the communities that live with them 
um, to come up with uh, solutions um, for some of the problems. Um, because we do not have an answer, um, it has to be something that we work together. Um, we can't provide all the answers um, because some of the answers are actually found within the communities that share their land with these, uh, with these particular animals. So Mary talked a little bit about um, the pilot uh, study that we did. And I would like you to keep this as your mental picture for navigating through the rest of uh, my part of the presentation. So that red triangle, I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit about that. But the area south of that triangle um, is what we refer to as our Salama study site. And the area north of that is an extension uh, where we're working with other partners. And that's more towards Nairobi. And so it links the Nairobi National Park to the Amboseli and Tsavo um, ecosystem. So the area north of that triangle is mostly um, commercial ranches. So there is, a, there is a bit of human footprint, but not as much. The area south of that triangle is, um, is undergoing a lot of changes. Um, there is an increase in human beings. Um, there is a decrease in prey species. And there is other things that are affecting uh, the long-term uh, sustainability of a cheetah population in that area. And the red triangle is a proposed technology city. So smack in the middle of the study area. Development is not bad um, if well planned. Um, but it comes with its own challenges. And some of the challenges that we've seen so far have been caused um, by fences. The fence, the red triangle, has, has been fenced. And through the fencing, um, we've had animals stuck inside of the fence that cannot get out. These animals, um, if it's not for human intervention, they die of thirst because there is no water inside of that triangle. They run into the fences and break their necks. And also the fences provide poachers with a very nice base to put up snares. And so as an organization and um, an organization that believes in working with the communities, we tried and mobilized everybody um, that could. And this is where we saw the power of the social media. Um, when we asked for help, um, we had students from universities in Nairobi coming out to help. Um, we had people um, coming out to help uh, put, put up, uh, provide the animals with water. And as you can see, this, these are just a few animals that ran into the fence um, because they can't, they could not see the fence itself. Um, but we don't, we don't just sit there and expect everything um, to be okay. Apart from the huge fences that come up, you know, we have an issue with poaching um, of the prey species that cheetahs depend on. We have retaliatory, uh, retaliatory killing of uh, predators um, by livestock farmers. Um, you can't blame them um, when somebody loses the animals that they depend on. Um, they're bound to be very angry. And we have to work with them because they share the land with these predators. We have to work with them throughout all the processes to try and minimize these conflicts that would lead to retaliatory killing. Most of the time, it's not the animal that was actually responsible for the conflict that gets nailed. It's just the first animal that they come across that they think caused the problem. 
removal of carbs. It's never talked about a lot, um, but there is an illegal pet trade still going on. Cheetahs are the most temable big cat. And there is this fascination of humans with spotted cats, and especially the cheetahs. And so we end up losing cubs to um, the illegal pet trade. Agriculture. It's important to feed the human beings, but agriculture and wildlife, most of the time, it's a no-no. Barriers are put to prevent wild animals from raiding the crops. These barriers prevent the wildlife from moving from one area to the other. Cheetahs require free movement. They're already genetically so identical that if they can't find partners, they become inbred so fast. So with the, um, I talked a bit about the fence, but what we did was uh, provide some water, hung up bottles so that the animals could see the fence and uh, as such, they don't break their necks running into the fence. But after a while, um, the animals started trying to jump over the water bottles, thinking that that was the end. And uh, so we've, we've had a few cases of animals trying to jump over the fence and they still go, they still hit the fence. Um, but we've had a reduced number of animals dying from the fence. Um, the biggest challenge has been humans. Um, they come in at night, open a section of the fence, and put up snares. And then try and chase the game towards the portion where there is an opening, where the snares are. And in the morning, they remove their snares and pull back the fence. But the animals have already gone in, and they can't find their way out again. So we still have some animals that are trapped now, again, inside that fenced-in area. KWS, we worked with them. They provided an helicopter and their capture team. We came out in numbers and tried to push as many animals outside of, out of the fenced-in areas as we could. Um, and uh, now we still have uh, a bit of animals left inside. Uh, Mary talked about the importance of roads and especially to cheetahs. We found a lot of evidence that cheetahs use roads very much. But roads are also proving to be a cause of uh, mortality. Since 2005, we've had nine cheetahs killed in our study area that we know of, and that's by vehicles. We've had nine cases um, the ninth one happened just recently in, up in Samburu since 2008. And those are roads that are not tarmacked. You do not expect uh, vehicles to be speeding, um, but they still get, uh, get um, killed on the road. And uh, we've worked, we try and work with local people in the places that we work. Um, to pass on the message, to, to um, find out what's happening in the community, people's view of conservation and the environment. And all my colleagues are hired from the areas where we work in. So we have um, Samburus working up in Samburu because they can speak the language, I cannot. Um, and sometimes, apart from speaking the scientific language, it's important to speak the local language or pass your message in a language that majority of the people, even the, one, the ones who have not gone to school, can understand. And so we've tried um, very hard to work with uh, people in the same, in the same areas where um, we are working. Um, capacity building has also continued. We've, we've done a few training sessions. Um, this one was a human wildlife conflict um, training that was sponsored our um, 
community officer um, was sponsored by the Cleveland Zoo and um, they learned a lot. And so some of these things help improve um, one's know-how and, and their interaction with, with, their, with their own um, community. Over the years, we've tried also to monitor what is happening with prey bears. What is happening with the prey that the cheetahs depend on? We've done um, transect counts by foot. We've done driving counts by vehicles. And these are some of the numbers that we, we are seeing. As the human footprint increases, as more and more land is lost to humans and, and, and agriculture, there is less prey available for cheetahs in the same area. A few of the species seem to thrive, but majority have declined, both in density and in abundance. So that has been one aspect of our research. The other one has been looking at movement patterns, and, and, and uh, this, this is specifically for, for the cheetahs that are in the areas where we're working in. So we, we deployed uh, two radio collars. We had two females that were collared. Um, this was the first female that was collared, and as you can see, our home range is quite small. She did not move in your typical cheetah movement. Cheetahs move range over a wide area, but she remained in a very small area. Moving a lot at night, and during the day trying to stay away from all the human activity. Sometimes we would, we would be tracking her and the signal would go dead. You turn around and she's just gone behind you. Not attracting any interest, but just trying to stay away from you. She had a very um, small home range, um, but that is not enough to say this is what happens to all cheetahs that are living outside of protected areas. We need more data, but also capturing cheetahs outside of national parks is extremely difficult. very difficult, which in one way is good, but in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in, in the science part, it's not very good because you spend so much time and energy trying to catch a cheetah that you never catch, but at the same time, you want them to be afraid of humans because they're spending, they live in the same areas, and if they get habituated to humans, somebody is going to get hurt, and it's mostly the cheetah that is going to get hurt. The second one, the second female, we named her Jen. And we also put a radio collar on a goat to see how people are grazing, how they're utilizing the land. And as you can see, actually, from this image, the longer line is our cheetah. And that's the, the one on the right-hand side, that's the goat. And at one particular time, they were less than a kilometer apart. But she did not go for the, for the goat. So you get these reports of conflicts. But what majority of the people fail to tell you is that, oh, I wasn't grazing in my land. I was grazing illegally in somebody else's land. So they tell you, um, yeah, I lost a goat to a cheetah. Um, what are you going to do about it? But they don't tell you that they were grazing illegally um, where they're not supposed to be grazing. So those are just a few of the things that you have to deal with. Um, but early this year, um, we also partnered with a few students because, because we can't do everything um, with the resources that we have. And there are certain aspects of cheetahs that we need help with. So capturing cheetahs, we partnered with Erica Hampson, the lady to your right. She's a student at uh, Antioch University. And she was going to look at different baits, you know, different attractants for, for cheetahs. 
so that we can see if there's something that cheetahs really like uh, that we can use um, without attracting all the other predators um, and uh, increase our success rate. And then we had Nelson Oange, second from your right. He's a vet and he was going to look at prey, hair, content in the fecal uh, material of cheetah. So collecting poop, it doesn't sound that cute, but <laughs> it's important. Um, the, one, the third one from the right um, was hired by Erica. So that's, um, his name is Mandela and Morgan Molly from North Carolina. And she was going to be working with the Smithsonian Institute uh, to look at stress hormone levels, also from poop. So for a long time, we've been using a live goat as our bait for cheetahs. Now, from the text, you can see that you know, it's, a, it's a bit challenging. Subject to theft, we've had goats stolen. Um, you have to feed them every day. You have to provide them with water. You have to make sure they, they're comfortable. But they also undergo through a lot of stress because you have hyenas visiting them every night. And most of, the, uh, most of them, after the baiting session, they end up dying. So we wanted to find something different, something that probably we do not have to subject a goat to this much of uh, stress. So Erica Hampson, after developing her proposal, she tested a few things. She st uh, tested uh, coyote lures. Um, I don't know whether you know them. They just bounce side to side. And um, at the San Diego Zoo, the cheetahs there seem to be highly attracted to those. Um, but testing them in the field would be something else. She tried, she tested uh, perfumes that have been used also in, at the San Diego Zoo. And uh, the cheetahs there seem to really like the obsession for men perfume. That sounded like a very good proposal, especially to me. You know, I could wear the perfume and attract the cheetahs to me. <laughs> and, um, the other thing that we, she wanted to test was, was cheetah bedding. So this is just straw that is, um, has been used by captive cheetahs. So they've peed on it and pooped on it, testing it out in the field to see whether it's going to attract um, any other cheetahs. Um, the last thing was what we call robogoat. So this has been our um, goat. Uh, it's a frame of Christmas decoration. I think it's a deer, reindeer or something. Um, with a motor, the head just moves up and down. So we took out all the lights and put a goat skin on it. <laughs> yeah, with the hope that uh, it would look um, like a goat uh, without necessarily having to come and feed it every day. So Erica Hampson came, um, came to Kenya to test all these things in the field. Um, she brought her coyote lures. Um, she brought the uh, perfume, which the San Diego Zoo had actually isolated the, the prominent compounds and made um, a, a very strong uh, concussion. And, um, she had six bait stations moving each bait type um, after a week and looking at what animals came to visit the bait station. I'll just go back a bit one. Um, the field work is done um, with interesting kind of pre preliminary res results. Um, the coyote lure seemed to attract bush babies. So, 
um, not really lots of predators. So if any of you are looking at uh, studying bush babies, that's your bait. <laughs> then the other students who are going to be working on the uh, fecal analysis and you know stress hormone and uh, and uh, the prey hair content. Um, the Athika PT is the northern portion. If you still have that mental picture, the Athika PT is the northern portion, mostly commercial ranches. So um, they had collected uh, at least 54 samples from there. And on the Salama side, they had collected around 60 scats. The hormone levels and what these cheetahs are feeding on are very important aspects of a long-term study um, for cheetah population, especially in an area that is undergoing so much human impact changes. Can you spot the difference? Who is that? So normally those are your typical cheetah and leopard, you know, patterns that you see. Um, but sometimes you see things that will take your breath away and you start wondering what is going on. So we have uh, a spotless cheetah that was born um, in the study area. He's around four years old. This picture was taken when he was two. He's still being seen around, um, and he's a very rare moth. But in the same area, we have these superb starlings, also showing a very interesting coloration. And we are very keen to find out what's happening with their genetics, and that has pushed the um, fecal st um, students um, to actually start thinking about going into uh, some DNA work. And uh, uh, the DNA work would, would uh, probably give us a few answers. Um, but these particular animals have um, colored our research in the last couple of days. Uh, I'll let Mary talk a little bit about the northern um, study site in Maybai, and uh, um, she'll be wrapping up. And I thank you all for coming and uh, paying attention. I'm very glad none of you has uh, uh, dozed off, so I'm quite pleased with myself. So thank you very much. So all of the work that Cosmos was talking about is everything that has been our pilot for the rest of the work in the other study sites that we showed you in the beginning. And as you can see from this one, this is the same kind of, this is the same data, but this is an overlay of cheetahs that are outside of protected areas and inside of protected areas. Almost 90% of the cheetahs live outside of protected areas, and that's why almost 90% of our time is focused outside of protected areas. So one of the issues that, that I've done some evaluation on is looking at the, the, the dynamics of the cheetah's habitat, which is the dick dick population, the scrub population, and the cheetah population together. And over time, they will, they will stabilize themselves and they will reach what we call an equilibrium, but then you have humans coming in and taking out habitat. And what happens to the rest of the population when that habitat declines? It's not just that the cheetahs need to breed with each other, but they need to find food. And the dick dick has become something that has been, become very apparent as one of the animals that are a key indicator in the population of cheetahs in the ecosystem. So what I actually did is I looked at what happens when 50% of the scrub ecosystem is taken out for agriculture, charcoal burning, livestock grazing, and what happens is that the dictics, instead of being able to range freely with each other, they become what we call density dependent, which means that they stay in one area, and therefore they can only breed up a certain number of dictics. 
and therefore those cheetahs have to move between those areas to find their prey. Um, but basically, as you can see from the blue line at the bottom, the cheetah population crashes if we don't do something to help those cheetahs. So I'm expanding a little bit further on those studies to try to, to simplify it, but that's, that's basically in a nutshell what we're looking at when we work with the human populations that are outside of it. So in, in the Samburu study area, we've selected an area called Maybai, which is in the northern section of the, what they call the Northern Rangelands Trust. It's the purple one. Um, we chose Maybai because over a, a three-year period of time, we used rangers and field scouts to give us data on where the cheetahs are located. And Maybai came up with the highest density population of cheetahs in the area. Um, and now we wanted to understand the differences between the behaviors of the cheetahs that are inside of protected areas and the movements between inside and outside of the protected areas. The first cheetah we put a collar on was also to test the equipment that we were using up there. And we put this collar on in February. The collar died in April. We didn't know the cheetah was going to swim. And what ended up happening is that water got into the collar and damaged the battery. Um, because this cheetah in that two month period of time crossed the river five times. Not just in shallow areas, she had to swim. Um, so we already learned something, but we lost our first collar from that. Um, at the time that the collar died, she disappeared for a while. We couldn't find her because we couldn't track her. Turns out she gave birth to four cubs. Two were killed by lions. She raised the other two successfully. So we had to time the removal of that collar for when the cubs were old enough that if something, God forbid, happened in the immobilization protocol, that we lost her, the cubs could survive without becoming captive. Um, but also we needed to catch her before she went into season again because we know that female cheetahs will stay with their cubs after they go into season. They'll go off and breed and they'll come back with their cubs for a short period of time. But we didn't wanna, we didn't wanna wait until that period where we knew she would be pregnant and we might cause the loss of another set of cubs. So our timing with the Kenya Wildlife Service was very critical. We also had this huge concern. This cheetah, Natanya, had a very, very small neck and her collar looked very tight because it was inside of the National Parks and Reserve, um, the National Reserve actually. Um, people began complaining that her collar was too tight. It was digging into her skin and being able to take this bottom photo to the county council in that area and to the tourist um, naturalists that work in that area and say this cheetah wore this collar for two years, there's not a single sign of any irritation on the neck. So it gave us a lot of credentials for the, the people in that area that we need to work with more closely in the future as well to be able to prove that that, that cheetah collar was not tight. I could fit it on my forearm. That's how tiny her neck was. It was a really, really tiny neck. But the main thing was that we needed to determine the reason for failure. The information we did achieve from two months is how active even inside of the national park that the cheetahs were. Um, this is kind of a confusing graph. It's 17,000 points on this graph. But what it actually shows us is those periods of activity. And this is, is uh, every 15 minutes, this collar would take an X, Y, Z coordinate. So it not only took the coordinate of the animal moving forward, but the head side to side and the head up and down as well. Um, and looking at this, she had two very, very strong periods of activity between midnight and 6 a.m. and again between noon and 6 p.m. were the most high periods of activity. That's just her alertness, not necessarily how much she moves forward. Um, meaning that she has to be very alert through the night when cheetahs don't see well. Um, the second thing that came out that was really interesting, we expected cheetahs outside of the parks to be very um, to move their longer distances when people weren't active, but we expected inside of the park where the lions, the leopards, and the hyenas are more active at night, we expected that the cheetah would be more sedentary at night. But in, in the graph to the right, you can see the little blue section there between midnight and 6 a.m. That's when she traveled the distances greater than one kilometer. So even she covered great areas at night, not just when there were full moons, actually not at all when there were full moons, but when there was the least amount of moon when all of the predators would see the least. Um, we don't know why yet, so sometimes our research brings us more questions than we have answers, and, and this is one of those cases. Why inside and outside are these cheetahs moving at night when they don't see so well? We face a lot of challenges working out in the bush, and our biggest challenge in the past couple of years has been a vehicle. These are all pictures that people who come and volunteer with us have taken of me. Um, 
and I spend a lot of time working on my car right now. Um, and our reason for this large trip and, and for us including you in this year's trip is that we are trying to get enough money to, to, to buy another vehicle. Um, I currently have about 20000 and I need about 45000 to buy, make the changes, and get a new vehicle, a brand new vehicle, that hopefully we can go for a long period of time in between field work without being in the workshop. Um, right now I have enough that I can buy something better than what I have right now, but I would like a couple of years of not visiting my mechanic. Um, so the, the, other, the other things that we're facing, we talked about this connectivity between cheetah populations um, and the need for the cheetahs to move over great distances and our need to catch these cheetahs, put collars on them and gain a better understanding to be able to bring that information back to the community and back to the people who make decisions on management. Also climate changes, this, this photo that, that I have at the end here um, is a river in our study area. We've never had a river in our study area before this year. Um, we're getting very severe and very long droughts. When we get the rain because of habitat loss and destruction, the rain does not soak into the ground, but it's now running to places and causing flash floods in places that we've never had flash floods before. Um, Cosmos is looking at his PhD in, in looking at human adaptations to the climate changes in this part of Africa and those conflicts between resources between wildlife and people. Um, and, and so that's, that's kind of what our next phases of research is, is to bring more of the climate change issue into what we do. He spoke a little bit about the meetings we have between people. We try to hold a monthly meeting in, in our study area in Salama, and now we're going to be starting that in Samburu. We invite Kenya Wildlife Service local administration to come, and we've been giving a Conservation Hero Award to people in the community. For those that have improved their livestock breeding, improved protection of their livestock, and improved their overall environmental concerns. Um, and so we give out these three awards in front of their peers and their colleagues to make them feel proud of the conservation efforts that they're doing. Our community projects have been to help improve people's livelihoods. Poor people don't care about conservation. They care about surviving from one day to the next. Um, and so if we can do things to help them to make money, the crafts that are for sale up here for the, for the few people that are able to still stay, um, we sell these crafts, we bring these crafts in from groups that are in our study areas, um, and we sell them to help them raise money. I'm trying to start a business. If any of you know a good business manager that would like to advise me on this business, um, I'm trying to start a business of importing these crafts and getting them into the zoos and, and things like that. Our tree planting projects have been mainly with schools, um, but also with some of the community groups as well, trying to see not only if we can put trees into the ground, we have planted about 10,000 trees in our Salama community, but that we can get those trees to grow and give people a, a, a better environmental caretaking attitude as well. Our school competitions, we do go to schools opportunistically. We don't have a full-time education officer, um, but we do that ourselves and with our volunteers that come out. Um, those competitions have been in drawing, in writing. Um, we've, we've given different types of presentations to them. And when we do these competitions, the reward is bringing the kids into the National Park and into the Nairobi Orphanage, which is our zoo in Kenya. Um, these kids have a good time. They take a lot of information back to their school, and they're very proud of what they've, what they've accomplished by winning these competitions. We work with the, with the um, wildlife clubs of Kenya. Um, which is the equivalent to what you work with in Tanzania. Um, our school presentations, we've tested different types of school presentations. We've tested um, the use of posters in places where we have no electricity. We've brought a generator in and shown movies. And we've brought puppets um, from the Brevard Zoo, the, the suitcase for survival puppets. And we did a pre and a post testing thing with what information the kids have, have received through the presentation, before and after the presentation, we give a test of the same questions. And um, some stats analysis was done and showed that actually our poster presentations, the kids took home the, the greatest conservation message. But that may just be because our puppet presentation was geared off of a small story and maybe didn't tell the full story. And our video presentation was about the differences between cheetahs and leopards. And then afterwards, we talked about our, our conservation efforts. So the message wasn't equally as strong in conservation, 
but it definitely showed that we were achieving our goal with a take-home message for the kids. The final thing that I want to talk to you about is what you guys do. Um, the fundraising efforts that you all do for conservation, not just for cheetahs, um, but what grants are available to us through the zoos, what you as volunteers and keepers do to raise money and to raise awareness of what we're trying to do in Africa is so important. And it's not just about raising funds, but it's about having fun while you do it and, and showing people that we can have fun and help other places. Um, the, the last thing that we, we did this past year is I had a group from my hometown high school that came out and did a water project with one of the schools. Now this high school is gonna be coming out every two years from now on. Um, they started with water, but our long-term goal is to get vegetable gardens into the schools. Um, and so they came with microscopes and water testing kits and talked about clean water issues, water, water catchment issues. You can't get yourself out of poverty if you don't have the water to do it. And so that's why we're trying to get that into the kids, into the schools. So a secondary school, a high school in, in America working with secondary schools in Kenya. Um, and, and this school has now really embraced it as their, as their partner schools working in the Salama area. I'm going to show you a little video about why what we're doing is so important. Have you heard of this video before? We are constantly being bombarded by problems that we face. And sometimes we can get completely overwhelmed. The story of the hummingbird is about this huge forest being consumed by a fire. All the animals in the forest come out and they are transfixed as they watch the forest burning and they feel very overwhelmed, very powerless, except this little hummingbird. It says, I'm going to do something about the fire. So it flies to the nearest stream, takes a drop of water, and it puts it on the fire, and goes up and down, up and down, up and down, as fast as it can. In the meantime, all the other animals, much bigger animals, like the elephant with a big trunk, could bring much more water. They are standing there helpless, and they are saying to the hummingbird, what do you think you can do? You too little. This fire is too big. Your wings are too little. And you're big, so small, you can only bring a small drop of water at a time. But as they continue to discourage it, it turns to them without wasting any time and tells them, I'm doing the best I can. And that to me is what all of us should do. We should always feel like a hummingbird. I may feel insignificant, but I certainly don't want to be like the animals watching as the planet goes down the drain. I will be a hummingbird. I will do the best I can. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of how we feel when we're out there. Sometimes we feel like we're being encompassed by overwhelming problems and overwhelming issues to the cheetah and to our environment. But we keep doing the best that we can, and we thank you guys for all of your support. Um, all of these zoos that have been helping us are very essential to what we do in Kenya, um, and we need to say thank you to all of you. Um, if anyone has any questions for Cosmos or I, um, please feel free to ask the questions. If you'd like to check out the crafts that we have, um, please come on up to the front. My sister Phyllis has been traveling with us through the last two months helping us in selling these crafts too, um, and we're very appreciative to her. So thank you.